uh, we have a pointer. Anyway, this line, okay, just to get your bearings. First of all, uh, here's the solid vapor triple point that is close to zero degrees centigrade, right? Here's the liquid vapor curve, and that almost straight line is actually tilted slightly left, and that is the usual thing that we draw in the PT diagram. The question is what happens to that line eventually? The argument was that that line cannot terminate in a critical point, and it does not. What it does is it bangs into other lines. So there's a whole system of phase transitions that happens from one phase of ice to the other. So ice is not just ice, you know, you go to your freezer and take out your ice cubes and put them in your glass, that is fine. But there are many phases of ice. And these differ, these are crystalline phases, and they differ in the crystal structure. So there's ice uh, 11, that's orthorhombic, and so on and so forth, and it goes, uh, goes on, and 3, 4, 5, Unfortunately, ice 9 is also right there, and it's a properly stable phase. I mean, uh, so, you know, in spite of Kurt Van Eggert. Yeah, all right, so, so this is the diagram. Notice this is uh, in centigrade, but it's uh, linear. Notice this is in uh, uh, Pascal's, but uh, it's uh, not, probably not linear, right? I mean. Yeah, it's, it's a log, it's a log scale. So these pressures are quite high. So, you know, so yesterday I told you six kilobars, somewhere wherever it is, six uh, kilobars is what you can withstand by doing fingernail pressure, which is true, but if you go higher, then even your skin cannot withstand that. Okay, so this is the phase diagram of water, and I wanted to tell you that the line does not terminate, it cannot terminate because this, there's a symmetry difference as pointed out by between a solid and a liquid. Which has the larger symmetry? No, 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 no. This is what he was saying yesterday. No, no. Sorry. Look at a liquid. Don't look at a configuration. Look at the average over a long time. This is a, a picture of the density. I've tried to make it uniform and homogeneous. Of course, I've not succeeded, but that's what it is. Therefore, if you sit here and you look around, everything is the same. That's a very high symmetry. Okay? It's not ordered. We don't care about that. I mean, it's not ordered in the sense of crystalline order. That's not the point. The point is the symmetry, and the symmetry is high. Here is the solid. When you look around, it is not homogeneous and isotropic. The symmetry is low. Okay. For instance, take translations, only under a lattice spacing shift will you have a, a you know, a, a, the same uh, state again. So, so remember this. There's a symmetry breaking, and the symmetry is lower. Now, uh, just a last general point I'll make, because this is not quite the topic of my uh, plan today. And that is that, you know, if you have many crystalline phases, and you go from one to the other, what is the order of the phase transition? Is it first order or continuous? I mean, you can't tell in general, but there's an argument due to Landau, which says that you know, in some situations it cannot be continuous. And those situations are one, so it depends on the two crystal structures. So for instance, if you're going from cubic to tetragonal, what is cubic? In two dimensions, cubic is a square. What is tetragonal? In two dimensions, it's a rectangle. You can deform a rectangle to become a square. Therefore, the, the tetragonal crystal group, subgroup or group, is a subgroup of the uh, cubic. It has a lower symmetry, so it's a subgroup of that. So it, it's contained in that. So, so it's possible for you to have a second order transition, a continuous transition from cubic to tetragonal. 
On the other hand, if you went from, let's say, BCC to FCC, there's no way in which you can make a slight defamation unless there is, is there? Probably not. No, you're changing the number of neighbors also, so you cannot do it. So those transitions, Landau argued, must be first order. Because there's nothing continuous about it. So it's a nice argument which you should remember. Okay, so that, so much for that slide. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yes, sorry. Yeah, okay, wait, wait, wait just a minute, yes. Yes, like a liquid. I haven't understood your notation. I don't know what is G or H or H. Right. Oh. Yeah. No, okay. So f first of all, let me say, suppose there is a change of symmetry whatever it is, whether it continues to discrete or uh, discrete to another discrete, if there's a change of symmetry, on physical grounds, we expect a phase transition. That is point one. Second point, uh, uh, so like you said, you have a high symmetry phase, somewhere it goes into H1, somewhere to H2, somewhere to H3. In each case, you'll get a transition. Like here, the liquid is going sometimes into that green phase, sometimes into the blue phase as a phase transition anyway. Okay, so there is, a, the moment there's a change of symmetry, you expect a phase transition. Let me just say expect. I mean, you know, you have to measure, but uh, there should be. Second, uh, just, just to make my point very clear, when you go from something that, you know, uh, contains the uh, new daughter phase as a subgroup, the transition may or may, may be first order or may be second order. But if you go from one to the other with no relation, no, no subgroup, then it has to be first order. Okay, so this is the statement. I'm not writing it, is it clear? So the statement is, if the new phase is not a subgroup of the old one, then the transition has to be first order. But if it is a subgroup, like cubic tetragonal, it may be and may not be. It doesn't have to be continuous. But at least it has the option of being continuous. Famous example is barium titanate. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. Barium titanate, many years thought to be a continuous transition, but very careful measurements show it's a weak first order transition. Yes. Yes. Is it possible? What I want to ask is, can there be two critical points? I mean. Can there be critical points? Two critical, more than one critical. Yeah, in, in general, of course, there could be more than one critical point, provided the phases don't differ from each other. In, for instance, I mean, you could have a, uh, I, I can't remember now. Um, I could be wrong on this, I don't remember. Samarium sulfide, you know. Why did I tell you about stretching the skin? You know, because, how do we know it's six kilobars? Because samarium sulfide is a black crystal. It's an insulator. I'm just telling you. You all probably know. Do you? No. no. It's unlikely you'll know. It's black in color, but if you scratch it with your nail, it becomes golden where you scratch. There's a phase transition from insulator to metal in that at six kilobars measured. So therefore, you know this is six kilo. Now, so the solid structure remains the same. It's an isostructural phase transition. Cubic to cubic. All that happens is that the volume collapses. So such a transition could terminate in a critical point. I can't remember whether it does. Uh, okay, I should ask somebody else, not sorry. Do we have some, uh, since you asked the question, can you find out by tomorrow, internet, SMS, samarium sulfide, look up the phase diagram and find out what, what happens to the first order transition. Okay, 
good. Uh, but we have to move ahead. So unless there's a pressing question, we'll move ahead. Non-pressing questions, we'll take a tea. Okay, next. Okay, here is uh, the data that Andrews obtained. These are all um, uh, isotherms, except normally we draw them this way, he's tilted them by 90 degrees. And uh, somewhere, can you recognize a critical isotherm? Just look quickly. Uh, probably this one. Okay, so these are coming in, and as you see, these familiar tie lines, which represent phase coexistence, and then so on. And uh, uh, 31.1, I think, is what he's written here. This is a 3, not a 5. And uh, it agrees remarkably well with the, you know, modern uh, value. And th this is pressures in atmospheres, you know. So here, if you read off slide, more or less roughly, it's about 75, actual number 77. So this is Andrew's data. This is, somebody asked me, was this the first time that a critical point was discovered? The answer is yes. Nobody knew of the existence of a critical point before this. 1863, he found it. Uh, next slide, please. And then on the same page that uh, this figure appears, this is in this Bakerian lecture. So if you want to read it, do Baker lecture, Bakerian lecture, and Drew's, and you'll find it. Okay, so then he writes a lot of things about this curve goes this way, that curve goes that way, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he's describing each curve in some detail. Next, please. But at the bottom of the page, there are two things that we've highlighted. Uh, in some other color. Uh, yeah, so, so he points out that uh, there's no phase separation between liquid and vapor at that temperature. Okay, that's the part in blue. Second thing he says is by uh, keeping the temperature around that critical temperature, the great changes of density which occur around this point produce flickering movements. He's looking at it and he's seeing a lot of movement there. Uh, I form, resembling an exaggerated form, uh, the appearance uh, exhibited during the mixture of liquids at different densities or when columns of heated air ascend through cold dust. I just want to uh, highlight this because we'll, it will have some bearing on what we discuss. He saw, he saw big changes of density and sort of big fluctuations. This is the key. There's a huge fluctuation in density. See, these liquids and liquid vapor transitions are difficult to uh, measure anything about critical points, etc., because of the presence of gravity. You know, unfortunately, liquid is more dense than uh, vapor, so there's a natural tendency for liquid to settle down. That's why people do experiments on space shuttles. On separation and so on, to avoid the effects of gravity, you know. And uh, uh, so, uh, in spite of gravity, he's seeing these huge, biggish fluctuations. Okay, we'll come back to fluctuations. Thank you. That's it. Can we raise the screen? Okay, so now let's get going with the... Uh, rest of the talk or rest of the lecture, I should say. Yeah. So again, I want to write down three things that we want to cover today. Yesterday, I wrote down three. We managed to do two. But that's a good, it's more than half. So today, I'll write down three, and we'll do three. Okay. All right. So what are the three things I want to discuss today? One, I want to talk about the correlation function. If I write small, too small, please remind me. Second, I want to discuss renormalization proof. The idea and the general formalism and what we can quickly extract. And at the end of that discussion, we should be able to argue for the existence of scaling. And the third thing is I would like to apply the RG, 
to the 1D Ising model. That's it. I mean, if you look at my outline given in, so by the way, I've given an outline. Are you all aware of this? You can go to your favorite ICTS site and look up the lecture, and you press on the lecture, you'll see an outline. So we, we are far behind the outline, not far, but a little behind the outline, but it's all right. Okay. Now, so let me begin with this discussion of point one, which is a very central and important thing in statistical physics. And of course, it has a special, uh, you know, status in the study of critical phenomena, and that is the idea of a correlation function. What is a correlation function? So let's imagine our magnetic sample, and let's imagine that we have two points, I and J. These are lattice sites, and we have spins on these. The, these SIs are plus or minus one, not minus infinity to infinity. Because you have to judge from the context whether SI is plus or minus one or continuous. It's plus or minus one. Okay, and uh, we want to know how things that happen near I influence things that happen near J. That's all. So what we'll define is something very simple. It's just this SI as J, and let's define this to be a function. In fact, let me just change the notation immediately. Let me call this I, I plus R, vectors everything. So there's a separation R. And so this is a function of SI, SI plus R. This is this function, and it's a function only of R, not of I. So long as I is not very close to the boundary. So let's imagine we have a you know, huge sample, maybe about the size of this room. And uh, here I am in the middle, not on the floor, but floating there. And then it doesn't matter if I'm here or there, distance r away is about this. So this is translationally invariant and a function of r. On occasion, we'll also want to look at a quantity called g of r, which is si, si plus r, minus the expectation value si, si plus r. These are just definitions. But you note, of course, immediately that this is equal to SI minus average SI times SI plus R minus average SI plus R. As a mild exercise, you can verify this. Okay? But writing it this way makes it a little clear as to what the meaning of G is. Because this is an average value here, and this is the deviation from the average. So this is like a fluctuation. This is another fluctuation. The question is, if there's a fluctuation here, how is it correlated to a fluctuation? By the way, although I didn't plan to say this, but let me add incidentally that this is equal to D of expectation value si plus r divided by d sub hi. Okay, what does this mean? What is hi? Do a thought experiment. You have your sample, no magnetic field, but now you become very microscopic and you put on a magnetic field only at site i. What will that do? That will polarize the site i. It will make the spin more likely to be up than down. But remember, that spin interacts with its neighbors. So that polarization will spread, and the neighbors with other neighbors. And slowly, the message may reach site i plus r. So by putting on a field here, you will induce an extra polarization there. How much? Well, so this is the measure of that. This is, this is a second exercise for you all. Please show that this is equal to this. This is quite straightforward. It's important, do it. I'm sorry to issue these commands like that, but, you know, <laughs> but, but please do it, okay, request. No, it's, it's very important that you do it. And if you can't do it, you know, come back and tell me and we'll do it. Okay, okay, now, 
So there are three exercises, okay. Uh, I'll just label them here. This is exercise one, this is exercise two, and exercise three is the following. Define P of R as the joint probability that SI and SI plus R are parallel. Okay, relate P of R to C of R. This is a simple relation, you should be able to do that. Okay, so this is exercise three. Now, of course, on occasion, G of R may reduce to C of R. For instance, if there's no magnetic field and if you're above TC, then the average value of SI is zero, in which case C of R becomes G of R, but uh, G of R becomes C of R. But uh, in general, it's actually more useful to think about actually both. All right. What is the behavior of these functions? Let's plot. C of R in zero field as a function of R above TC. What do you think happens? How does it behave? Ah, that's correct. So it just falls. And uh, the uh, way it falls is roughly exponential, but uh, okay, in some way. So let me write down the fall, G of R, this is G, sorry, no, C, let's keep it as C. So C of R falls as E to the minus R over Psi. Actually, if you're careful, there's also a power law correction to this, divided by R to the lambda, some, some number lambda. Lambda is not, repeat, not a critical exponent, it's just a power law correction to this. This is the dominant term, uh, this is t bigger than tc. As you approach tc, this all slows down. So it becomes something like this, and it doesn't decay exponentially, it decays as a power. What is the power? It's not lambda. Okay. It's one over, traditionally written as one over d minus two, d is the dimension, plus, and here's the critical exponent, new one, eta. For t equal to tc. That's the red curve. What about below TC? Well, below TC, you have a finite value of the magnetization. So that means that even if your spins are very, very far away, so that they don't interact, essentially, with each other, but they're still are aware of the magnetization. The average SI is not zero, but we are plotting C. So the way it behaves is that it just falls. Again, typically exponentially, but reaches a constant value. It's supposed to be parallel to the axis. This constant value is the magnetization squared. Okay. In some sense, which is why we subtract off that value when we look at G of R. So G of R will be the same for these two situations, and here it will be, uh, you know, without the constant. Is that uh, clear? Mm. Yeah, I think this is correct. What is M naught? M naught is what the spontaneous magnetization, namely, if you are looking at M versus H, 
that curve and you have a jump of this sort, this is m0. And that is, by the way, minus m0. Okay. Actually, for those who care about strict mathematical points, let me point out that this definition, I mean, this is, this is the definition of what's called spontaneous magnetization. Okay, it's magnetization in spite of having almost no field. You put in a field, but you just take the limit, field goes to zero after you take the thermodynamic. So that is called spontaneous magnetization. Um, this one, M0, I define this way, is called long range order. I mean, I don't know who invented the term, but uh, whatever. Um, everybody expects that the two magnetizations are the same, but nobody has proved it. As pointed out by Griffiths, this uh, it would be important to prove, but uh, the, the proof is lacking, and uh, it would be, one should just know there's no proof, but you know, in the end, we are not magnetizations, we are physicists. We are, what is important is the truth. Also important are proofs, but in that order, truth and then proofs. A proof which is not true is no good. Okay, so so it is true, but uh, uh, we haven't been. We meaning humanity has not been able. Not just this class. Okay. Right. Good. Anything else I want to say? Yes, quite a lot more. Somewhere, quite innocuously, we've introduced this quantity psi. This is called the correlation length. It plays a central role in the theory, and therefore we should recognize it. Uh, what is the meaning of psi? Well, here it is. I mean, let's just draw vague volumes of size psi, radius psi, all over the place. And the meaning is simply very simple, that if you have a point here, then, you know, what happens here is affects things that in this radius and practically no effect outside, exponentially. Okay. So this is the first thing. So it's the volume, psi to the d is the volume over which things are correlated. I mean, fluctuations are correlated. So if you're doing a neutron scattering experiment and you send in the neutron, like I think yesterday one of the speakers did. Neutron has a magnetic moment, it flips a spin somewhere. Now, or, or if you like, the spin flips the moment of the neutron. So the neutron goes ahead and then, you know, sees whether something else has been affected by that flip. And it will find that, yes, it, these things have been affected, but not this. Okay, so I'm just saying in words what, what I said, in some other way earlier. Okay, now the important point is that this psi becomes infinite as you approach TC. And it becomes infinite rather strongly. By the way, in critical, phenomena, critical phenomena, it's important to distinguish between strong divergences and weak divergences. Susceptibility diverges very strongly. Correlation length diverges strongly. Specific heat diverges very weakly. And weak divergences we have to be very careful about. We'll see if there's an occasion to uh, talk about them a little later. Uh, okay, let me not get, get into a discussion of specific heat. All right. So this is a correlation length versus temperature. And it's actually becoming infinite at TC. That means a fluctuation anywhere will affect something any, everywhere else. Of course, with the falling amplitude, power law, but power laws are very slow. This is a huge effect. Now, this is, some, in some sense, the reason why there is universality. Why? Because we are talking about such big length scales that the details of the interactions don't matter so much, whether it's neon or argon or methane, won't matter so much. You know, it's the fact, this is hand wavy. 
It's a little too hand wavy, but this at least begins to give you an, you know, a feeling of why there may be universality. You know, it's the fact that the correlation lens has now become the relevant lens, not the interaction lens. And that's why critical phenomena are sort of governed by universal features. Okay. So let us imagine we are very close to, but not at TSA. So I have this huge volume, and then there's this outside. Question, how does G of R, or if you like C of R, uh, behave as a function of R? We are not at TC, but we're very close to it. Okay, so let us say that uh, the correlation length is about 1,000 in some lattice units. 1,000 is pretty big. How will the correlation function behave? Which of these formulae will describe it? Where, where, where are they going? Ah, here. Okay, I forgot to write the last one here, C of R. to some power mu, which is not equal to lambda, by the way. Okay, but uh, which of these formulae will apply? You might think that since T is not TC, let's say it's above TC, this should apply, but you would be wrong. So let me make this point. If Xi is very, very big, suppose instead of 1,000, we make it something bigger. Shall we be bold? Let's make it a million. Okay, and we're looking at phenomena on this scale of 20 or 30 lattice days, okay, which is also quite big. The sites which are separated by 30 lattice spacings just know about a huge correlation length. They don't know that that correlation length is not infinite. They don't care whether it's million or infinity is about the same. Therefore, they think that you are at TC. And therefore, the fall, here follows 1 over r to the d minus 2 plus eta. This is very important. Please keep this in mind. Only when you reach of order xi and larger that the other form takes over. No, no, I'm just saying that um, let us say there are two sides. There's you and there's me. We are the two. Now, we are concerned with how the correlations are. There's a theoretical or hypothetical situation where the correlation length is infinite. And in that case, we know the thing falls as a power, 1 over r to the d minus 2 plus eta. Now, let us make it not infinite by just moving a little bit away from Tc, some pico degree away from Tc. Okay. Now that thing is not, uh, the correlation length is not uh, infinite, it's about one kilometer. But on the time scale, uh, on the space scale that we are at, whether it's one kilometer or infinity, it doesn't matter. It's as good as infinite. Therefore, the formula for infinity should apply. It's just by continuity, I'm not doing anything very uh, profound, okay? But here, outside, it's e to the minus r, uh, r to the lambda. Okay, just keep this physical picture. So correlations are critical until the correlation length, roughly, and then exponential outside. Is the statement clear? Why can't you take a large what? Large psi. Yeah. No, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm taking a limit by making it not infinite first. If it's not infinity but one kilometer, and I'm on the length scale of a meter, then uh, it's irrelevant whether uh, I have a one kilometer or inf you know, infinite kilometer. Correlation. 
Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. You're right in that sense. Th that's because I didn't write uh, everything uh, here. And R bigger than of order of sight. This holds only if that. Arguing everything within a very large correlation. In the end, we have finite samples. You know, the correlation lengths cannot exceed finite distances, and yet we see critical behavior. So this is a proof. All right. Now, uh, yeah, the last thing I wanted to say is uh, that uh, G of R obeys scaling. So g of g as a function of is a function of r and the temperature, and it falls as one over r to the d minus two plus eta times the scaling function of r and temperature. In this way, writing t to the new like this is tantamount to writing r divided by t to the minus new t to the minus nu is the way correlation length, I mean correlation length behaves. So this is a function of r over psi. Okay. So uh, I just point out that uh, amongst other things that obey scaling, so does the correlation length. Okay, so as I argued, the fact that the correlation length diverges is important. Now, let's come back to real magnitudes. In a magnet, uh, how far are the spins from each other, nearest neighbor spins, roughly? Micron, angstrom, roughly angstrom. So, angstrom is, some people will say 10 to the minus 8, others will say 10 to the minus 10. I mean, my generation will say 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. You'll lose a meter, then. Okay, 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. Okay. How, what is the wavelength of light? Sorry? No, you'll use nanometers. Now, this is angstrom. Yeah, so 5,000 angstroms, let's say. So it's about a 1,000 times bigger than the lattice space. Well, what happens is that you know, these spins are interacting with each other just uh, two angstroms away from each other. But these correlations spread very far. They can spread up to the, up to thousands. If they spread to thousands, then they match the wavelength of light. And therefore, if you shine light through a sample, that will have an effect near the critical point. So this is an effect called critical opalescence. Okay. Psi becoming of order wavelength of light leads to critical opalescence. And uh, the way it's seen is if you have, for instance, a critical point in a binary liquid mixture. You have two transparent liquids. You just see two transparent liquids. You might see a meniscus. The, the, the two are separate if they're below TC. But then as you approach TC, first of all, the meniscus goes away because it's becoming one fluid. And it becomes smoky or milky or whatever. Now, the best person to tell you about this is Abhishek Dha. Because many years ago, when uh, I don't remember the year, but uh, was a student at TIFR, and he actually did this experiment. So don't think of him as a theorist. He's an experimentalist in disguise. Okay, and uh, I mean, if you if you remember the mixture, you can tell us. But this is very easy to find on the internet. Who will volunteer? Somebody should volunteer. I expected about four hands to go up. Then. Shall I draft somebody in? Mm. Okay, will you find out by tomorrow? I mean, just find out two liquids which have a co this consolute point or critical point, which is close to room temperature. 
find out the temperature and find out the critical value of the uh, fractional concentration. And then we will see whether ICTS can manage to procure this in the next three days. Let's see. Okay, but, but so it will help if you can find out by lunchtime. It will help then. Right. Let's see. Okay. Well, it's a nice thing to see. It suddenly becomes turbid. So this is why I pointed out that paragraph of Andrews. He saw these changes of density because we're not sure that whether he saw opalescence or not. But, uh, you know, things were happening. So this is a very direct proof. I mean, experimental proof. Right? You see, all, proofs are not only mathematical. Proofs are also in everyday life and experiment also. I mean, I'll use the word proof. Uh, it's a proof that the correlation length is actually very large, 1,000 times uh, uh, the interaction range. That, that's okay. So this is in, and uh, I mean, in magnetic systems, in ferroelectrics, etc., there are now routine measurements by neutron scattering primarily and other scattering experiments, which measure these lengths, and they become very large. At this point, I finished my discussion of point one. Okay. Let us go to point two. This is the renormalization. And uh, the first thing we'll do is we'll draw a picture with some. Many things will take quite long to draw it. So let's draw nine blocks. And in each block, we'll put in. Spins. I could have drawn four blocks and four spins in each. I mean, by the way, the number of blocks I draw has nothing to do with the number of spins inside. Just that I like number nine. Okay, I guess you're having a race with me, let's see, if you're copying at all. Nowadays, I've noticed many students uh, sort of sit and watch rather than copy, which is also fine, so long as they get something out. But okay, so, so what we've done is we have a lattice, let's say a square lattice, with only the yellow spins. These white things are fix uh, a fiction. I've just drawn some blocks. By the way, yeah, I haven't drawn these spacings. You could imagine a proper square lattice and some uh, blocks. What are these blocks? Blocks are this imaginary sort of concept, uh, construct, where I'm grouping, it's a grouping of nine spins together. These nine, these nine, etc. Et so this is the first step. By the way, we've done the first step in the renormalization. So you should be quite happy. So step one, in fact, I'll call it step 1A, uh, make blocks of size B. B is a linear size, so here is B. In this picture, it's 3. Okay. One B. Associate a block spin. Now that we've used the word block with each. Each means each block. So where are they? Okay, here, here they are. I'm drawing them. This red stuff is a single spin, if you like, but it's one for each block. That's the red spin. We've completed this. So let's call the old spins SI, the set, Ising spins, you can imagine, or some sort of spin. OK, now we are going over into a new um, set of uh, things. OK, let's label these red ones by I prime. Prime will usually be used for the block variables. And on the 
At each side A prime sits a spin S prime of I prime. Okay, we haven't said how, what we do, etc., etc., but we're imagining that there are spins, they're called S prime of I prime, and somehow they're derived from SI. How are they derived? Well, that's a bit up to you. The way they're derived is called, it has to do with the exact renormalization group that you are implementing. But uh, you should do something sensible. Now, you know, one popular and very sensible thing to do. This is number of minutes over or left? Uh oh, okay, so I've been gone more than half. All right, so now uh, the, uh, yeah, so we need to have in some sense a way to find the S primes from the S's. How shall we do it? Well, fortunately, for some reason, I chose an odd number of spins, small spins in each block. So we could just look at the majority. For instance, that's one way to do it. You could do, do some other rule, which is also sensible. Uh, it doesn't much matter, but SI primes, S primes of I primes are functions of SI. Example, EG, I'll just say majority rule, but there, there are a uh, large number of possible rules that you could, uh, ways in which you can associate S prime with SI. Now we come to step two in the renormalization. That is, we sum over all SIs. But if you're summing over all SIs, you'll just get a partition function or something. But no, we do it for fixed values of S primes. So we come in and first of all say that this S prime may be up. This may be up. This may be down. Specify them, and having specified them, you sum over all S's which are consistent with that. For instance, if you've chosen a majority rule, in this block you can include only configurations where there are more ups than downs. In this block you can include only configurations in which there are more downs than ups. Is that idea clear? In other words, we are doing a sum. Okay, so right now I don't want to, I was trying to avoid writing formulae, but uh, perhaps we could do it. For instance, if, uh, you do a sum over all the SIs. Suppose you wanted to find the partition function or, or some, some reduced something. You'd have a weighting with the uh, partition function. So minus H, you'd absorb temperature somewhere, somewhere, uh, which is a function of all the SIs. And now we'll impose the rule. So, for instance, one way to impose the rule will be through, what is that function called? Heaviside function, no? Heaviside is one and zero, right? Yeah. So, heaviside function, theta function, which is one if uh, x is positive and zero otherwise, right? So, uh, how shall we impose it? Oh, no, 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 no heavy side. Sorry, we need a delta. Sorry. Yeah, so we need a delta. Kronecker delta of S i prime prime and the sign of summation S i. I in, in that i prime. That will work. If the majority is up, let's say nine, no? so suppose uh, seven are up and then two are down. So summation SI will give you five, majority. The sign of five is positive. So this will work if this is positive, otherwise that. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that when we do a sum like this, a constraint sum, we'll get a function of the S primes. Okay, so this is schematic. I may have gotten some factors wrong, so don't take it too literally. We'll, we'll write the right formula later, but this is the idea. 
sum over all the little spins, keeping the big spins being what, whatever they are. No. SI primes are specified to be uh, plus or minus one. These are also plus or minus one spins. Thank you for the question because I didn't make this clear. We are going from a system of uh, spins which are plus or minus one to another system in which the spins are plus or minus one. But the plus one and minus one and the big spins will just indicate the majority of that. Whether it's majority by zero, or, sorry, no, no, it can't be zero. By one or two or one or three or five, it, it's the majority. All those majority things are lumped into one. Is this clear? Any other question? Okay. So, you know, so mentally go over all the nine, you know, two to the nine configurations of nine spins. Is two to the nine divisible by two? Yes. Right. So half of them will be, uh, you know, of the sort that will prefer, uh, which are consistent with SI prime being one, and half of them are not. Don't, don't uh, sum over the knots. One way to do it formally is to write this delta function. And we'll just get zero if they are not, which is a way of not summing. Okay. All right. So, good. Yeah, so then you invent a new rule. Don't take majority. Or you can take majority because sometimes there is a majority. Now, sometimes when there's a tie, you can toss a coin. You can equ choose equally, randomly. That, that's something. But uh, to avoid all such questions, choose, choose an odd number. I mean, the exact transformation is not so um, central to our discussion today. Majority. All right. Two. Okay, so this we've already said. Sum over Okay. Now Okay. In the process, what is the aim? Okay. The, why are we doing all this? The aim is to derive effective interactions. I'm looking for yellow. Okay, doesn't matter. You will take some other thing. Ah, here. Yes. This was just associate. I mean, this is like majority rule. That is the rule. Now we are doing a sum. By sum, I mean this sort of sum trace. Okay, so it's a different thing. Association is a loose thing. I mean, I'm just telling you this is how we'll associate. Okay, now, uh, yeah, what is the aim? The aim is somehow to pass to a description where we have effective interactions green in color between the red spins. We started with these interactions, let me call them K, and we are now introducing and generating interactions which we call K prime. The whole idea is to calculate the escape primes. Okay, that's the idea. So we want we uh, uh, this and, and to find the effective subplanes. Third and last step, 
very important. So you'll agree that the new lattice is bigger than the old. But we want to apply this procedure many, many times. So we'll apply it now to the red spins and get purple spins and then purple to orange and so on. Then the lattice will keep getting bigger and bigger. We don't want that. We want it always to look like the old lattice. So what we'll do is we'll shrink this lattice. We will rescale. Aim, try to make this problem look as much as possible like the starting one. One way it is different is all these spins are very far. Okay, so you bring them together. In this, um, to achieve the same, the first thing you have to do is to scale the length. The other thing you may have to do is to rescale the spin, but in this formulation, in, 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 at least in my present discussion, we don't have to. So let, let, let me not even put it down. Sometimes it's necessary to rescale the value of the spin, but we don't have to do it here. So this is it, finished. So like you can pack up and go. This is the renormalization group, step R. What? OK, how did we make it big? We made it big by the following. We said that we are dealing with new spins, red spins, these majority spins. These were uh, formed from this three by three block of the old spins. And uh, for each block we did it. So I think you can even see that the spacing here is bigger than the spacing between the yellow spins. How much bigger in this picture? Three times. So it, so these spins are, see earlier you had spins here, here, here. Now your spins here, there, here. But we don't want that. We will artificially shrink these so that they look again like the old spins. I mean, like the old lattice. Okay? So you understood the steps, yes. Aim is to generate new couplings for uh, these block spins, and then to follow what happens to these couplings as we change, as we apply R again and again. And we'll see that by following them, we learn a lot. Okay, so that, in five minutes you'll see why. Okay, so let, let, let's go. Uh, can I write here or not? Okay, I'll write up to here. Is this okay? Now, so this is the renormalization group transformation. Okay, what is the effect of it? I mean, we sort of just talked, we haven't done anything. Well, the most important effect is the following. So we've gone from a lattice with some coupling constant k to a similar looking lattice with some coupling constant k prime. Okay, big deal. What? But remember, we're interested, let's say, suppose we're thinking of phenomena close to the critical point, where there is a nice correlation length, psi. Correlation length is a very physical thing. It tells you that this can affect that. Now you've shrunk the lattice. The effect will be to shrink psi. By how much? By the factor b. So psi prime is equal to psi divided by b. Main thing, b of course is larger than 1, so this has fallen. Now this is very important, the fact that the correlation length has fallen. 
because that means this new system is not as correlated as the old. Suppose uh, your psi was 3000 to start with. Sorry? No. Isn't what true? No? Suppose psi is 3000. Psi prime will be 1000 because B is 3. Still big. Still too big for comfort. So do it again and again and again. Reduce by factor 3. So what I'm saying is uh, apply this L times. So is psi of L, psi sub L will become original psi divided by B to the L. If you apply this about 10 times, oh no, I don't know. What is 3 to the something should equal some thousand? I, um, I don't know. But less than 10 times, okay, this will shrink very much. Now, what is the advantage of shrinking? Advantage is that we have a system with very few, little correlation. But if we have very little correlation between spins, we know how to handle it. Mean field theory will work like a charm. So this is the point. We have a strongly correlated system. We don't know what to do with it. Well, we apply this procedure. The system marches away, reaches some situation, which is mildly on almost uncorrelated. Good. Now we stop. We invoke mean field theory. We solve the problem. But we know exactly how we've transformed on the way. We can transform back. So this is the answer to your question. This is why we are doing all this. Okay? Okay, so this is, if you like, a central idea of the renormalization. Shift away, solve the problem, come back. Because it relies only on the properties of the transformation. At each step, the transformation is very nice. I mean, okay, nine is a, some people may call it large number. I'll call it relatively small compared to our God. And uh, so you can deal with the system with nine spins. The, the mappings are all sort of simple analytic functions. There's nothing to do. But of course, I mean, I've hidden a lot of things in just saying it, but, but this is essentially right. So if you make a wise choice of R, you'll get sensible answers for the, uh, for your problem. What is the real difficulty? Why, can't, why haven't people been doing this up and down? The answer is this step. How do you do this step? Even without the delta functions, this was the evaluation of the partition function, and this was very difficult. Now you've made it more difficult by adding these constraints. So this is the step which cannot be done in full entirety, but, you know, we are physicists. We know how to invent approximations. So we will make approximations here, which will, which will have some rough validity, and be able to make progress. So this is the philosophy. And as we know in physics, an approximation is a really good approximation if it becomes exact in some limit. And we'll find that many approximations which appear very ad hoc actually become very correct in some limit. And we'll see some of these things. Okay, but this, remember, Now I have to tell you that when we talked about k going to k prime, we were thinking perhaps of nearest neighbor couples. But there's no guarantee that the k primes will involve only nearest neighbor couples. I mean, after all, you've done quite a lot of things here in this trace. Uh, and indeed, you will generate second neighbor couplings. You may generate four spin couplings, etc., etc. It might go out of hand. Well, the best thing to you know, because 1 becomes 4, becomes 16 couplings. But we don't want the number of couplings to keep increasing. So what do we do? We start with all of them anyway. We have nearest neighbor, second neighbor. Then they can't increase because we have all. 
was where my joke. Okay, anyway, all right. So, yeah. I don't know what you mean by sensitive, but uh, I mean, this procedure is uh, prescribed for all dimensions. I mean, how well it will work. Work in a particular dimension will depend on many things, not only the dimension. Okay, so the first thing is we have to realize that we're dealing with a whole lot of couplings. So let us imagine a situation where we have nearest neighbor, next neighbor, third neighbor, four spin couplings, eight spin couplings, the whole lot, every possible coupling. Too much to write them all, so we'll just write it as vector k. This is the vector in um, coupling um, space, okay? It's, if you like, it's the space of Hamiltonians. Because if I change k a little bit, I'm changing some coupling, I'm changing the Hamiltonian. So people sometimes talk about this thing, but it's all right, it's just a bunch of couplings, k. This will now go over into k prime. Is the idea clear? You can have more than one coupling and we just see how they work. Nearest neighbor coupling may go up, second neighbor may go down, whatever we keep track in principle. Now, um, okay, what will this set K contain? It contains a constant term plus genuine couplings. Why constant? Because, you know, when you, suppose you don't have a constant to start with. Normally, you don't put in a constant in the Hamiltonian. But once you do this step, you will also generate a constant, multiplying everything. So you may as well put in also a constant. So suppose we put in the constant term plus couplings. Okay, constants actually don't have much of an effect on anything, but to be very complete, I'm putting it. Okay, now we come to a very central and important idea. This is the idea of a fixed point. Now, a fixed point can arise whenever you have uh, self-consistent equations or something or the other, but in this context, it has a nice and very important meaning. So try to understand this point very carefully. Suppose uh, k prime equals k except for the constant. See, because we've done something to it, this answer can't be exactly the same. The way it differs, what, one way in which it may differ is through a constant. So we don't mind the constant being different. There was a constant C1, it was a C earlier, now it's become C prime. We don't mind that. But uh, we throw away the constant for the moment. I mean, maybe I shouldn't have put it in. But all the actual couplings are reproduced. Then we'll say that this is a, a special situation and we'll call this set of couplings K star. So, uh, okay, I forgot to write here. Maybe I should have written this. So the way we'll write it is that k prime, this goes to k prime, which is R operating on k. Think of operator, doesn't it? I mean, it's a transformation. So k star then as a vector is equal to R k star. Okay, that's the definition. But now there's this very simple but alarming consequence. The consequence is that the, you started with the Hamiltonian. You've landed up with the same Hamiltonian. From Hamiltonian 1, you can calculate correlation functions. From Hamiltonian 2, you can cal calculate correlation functions. Therefore, from Hamiltonian 1, you can calculate correlation length. Hamiltonian 2, you can calculate correlation lengths. But these Hamiltonians are identical. So it must be that in this situation you have Xi prime equal to Xi. Because the Hamiltonians are identical, they haven't changed. 
Why have they not changed? Well, because we have the fortunate circumstance that they did not change. Star. Okay, star. So at a fixed point, we must have this. But this is mildly, or at least maybe more than mildly alarming, because we said and we boldly proclaimed that psi prime is equal to psi by b. So let's write that again. How can this be? Well, the answer is very simple. It can happen only if psi is zero or infinity. Okay. So we conclude on the basis of this argumentation that there are two types of fixed points, those that correspond to zero correlation length and those that correspond to infinite correlation length. What are the situations, just a sec, which correspond to zero correlation length? Well, infinite temperature. Nothing is coupled to you. What is the situation that corresponds to zero correlation length at the opposite side? It's zero temperature. At zero temperature, there are no fluctuations. And correlation length actually goes very rapidly to zero. So this situation uh, corresponds to eg, you can say eg, t equal to zero or infinity. Infinity corresponds to critical point. But let me make this statement very clearly. The clear and correct statement is that a, a fixed point which has psi equal to infinity corresponds to a critical point. The reverse is not true. Not all critical points correspond to a fixed point. In fact, they don't. Majority don't. But it's all right. I mean, we are going step by step. We are, bothered. We are talking about fixed points. And I'm just telling you that there's some fixed points which are critical and some fixed points which are very uncorrelated. I haven't said that all critical phenomena in the world are fixed points. They are not. Just be aware of the distinction. It's, I mean, since I didn't say it, maybe you wouldn't have taken the wrong implication, but just in case you did, I said it. Okay, so this is a very important uh, uh, juncture. Yes, there was a question. Uh, so when you wrote that equation for uh, psi n equal to psi by b, yeah. so that is assuming that k and k prime are constant. Like when you're saying these no, 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 no. No, no, certainly not the same. K goes to K prime. In fact, as we said, it becomes uncorrelated, meaning K prime becomes very weak. Okay? All right. Any other question? Yes. No, no. Uh, first of all, Psi, yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, psi, um, I mean, B is something that you invented and, you know, came up with uh, because you wanted to discuss renormalization. Psi existed anyway. It's a real correlation length. Huh? It's a function of the case, but it's, uh, it's actually there. I mean, independent of uh, what you do to, you know, further your ends. Well, you just check. You see if the couplings are exactly the same as before. That's all. Yes. Yes. All the, the full list of couplings should be exactly the same as before, except for, perhaps for the constant term. 
because in the calculation of correlation length, the constant will not. Everybody on board so far? Okay. No, I argued that it must be a critical point uh, only on the basis that I, I first argued that psi must be zero or infinity. And then I separated the two. And I said psi equal to zero corresponds to some sorts of situation, zero temperature or infinity. I mean, we know that separately from the meaning of psi. Okay. And then we said, there's also psi equal to infinity. So let, let us see what that corresponds to. And as we've been arguing in the last lecture and today, psi equal to the correlation length diverges at a critical point. This is the definition, if you like, of a critical point. The place where uh, correlations do not decay exponentially. It is infinite anyway, so it will remain infinite, but this is a very interesting question as to what will happen at an ordinary critical point, which is not a fixed point, when we apply the coupling. And what will happen, let me just tell you, we have to demonstrate this, is that this critical, the, the couplings will change. But they will change in such a way that psi remains infinite, because infinity divided by b is infinite. They'll keep changing and changing and changing until they approach the fixed point. To start with, they will not be fixed point values, but they will become fixed point values. No. It's the same, it's the same set of couple. We always start with an infinite system. Which example? Yes, yes. No, K prime is the coupling. So, for instance, I mean, uh, what it means is that if you had a Hamiltonian, which was K, sum over nearest neighbors, plus K2, sum over ne next nearest neighbors, Etc. I have an H prime now, which is K prime sum over IJ, same form. Except I'm dealing with primes. So it's a coupling. It's not the number of spin. Any other question? Now, since uh, we have agreed that psi equal to infinity fixed points actually describe criticality, let us study the vicinity. So let's go. Okay. So let us summarize, yes. Sorry? I don't know what you want to call it. It's a transformation. You can represent it as an operator. Okay. It's, it's the set of three things. But as we'll see, in the space of couplings, it's like an operator. That you puzzle over. I mean, if you have two Hamiltonians which are identical, they'll have identical, the system will have identical properties. It will have the same specific heat, same correlation functions. No, no, at the moment we have stopped blocking.
but the variables are exactly the same, the Ising variables. The Hamiltonians are actually identical except for the constant term. And uh, if that is so, all properties of the system will be identical, including psi. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's right, correct, in the lattice spacing of the new system which is where, they, where also the equality psi prime equal to psi by b holds, just to confuse you. Yes, reduce. No, otherwise, it will always reduce when you apply. Okay, so now, we have eight and a half minutes. Let's go. So, let's apply R L times. Okay, what happens then with that? Okay, suppose the number of spins was not absolutely infinity, but 10 to the 22. Okay, and then we apply this, and then that will reduce by this much. V to the D is the volume, the number of spins, which became a single spin, under one renormalization, and I apply it L times. The set of couplings goes into this new set of couplings, K super L. The correlation length goes into psi super L equal to psi divided by B to the L. B to the L because I've applied B, 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 L times. Factor B reduction each time. And, and the free energy per site, including the constant term, will equal B to the DL times F. Okay, so F goes, I should have written it this way F goes into FL equal to B to the DL times f. Why? Because uh, you've just grouped a lot of stuff together and you call it one site. This red spin is one site. It actually had nine of those old sites. And uh, if you allow for the volume factor, the free energy per site will change in this way because it has more free energy. But here it's crucial that you include the constant. Okay. All right. Now, uh, so as we said, we'll use this notation k prime equal to vector k prime into r. We'll put a subscript b for to remind ourselves that there's a length scale transform equation b. Okay, this is all very well vector notation and all, but what does it mean? It means the following. I mean, there's a whole bunch of equations. Let's write them. K1 prime equals a new function of uh, K1, K2, etc. So let's call that a function R1 of K1, K2, etc. K2 prime similarly is R, some function R2 of K1, K2, etc. When we said we generated new couplings, K1 prime, K2 prime, of course they depend on the old couplings. So let's call the functional dependences, the functions R1, R2, etc. Ah, now, so at a fixed point, of course, we have the same things happening, leaving out the constant. K1 star equals R1 of K1 star, K2 star. Okay, good. So this is, it goes on.
Which numbers? No. Total. Now, I'm contradicting what I said a little while ago, where I said we're dealing only with infinite systems. But suppose a system has 10 to the, tw 10 to the 22 atoms, or sites. After rescaling, nine of the sites have become one. So you have to divide 10 to the 22 by nine. That will be the number. Nine because it's three squared. Squared because it's two dimensions. In D dimensions, it's B. Okay. Any other question? Otherwise, we push on. Three and a half minutes. Okay. All right. So now that we know what happens at the fixed point, let's ask what happens near the fixed point. So let's define delta K1. K1 minus K star. K delta K2, etc. Then I can write in matrix form what delta K1 prime, delta K2 prime are. They depend on delta K1, delta K2, but there's a matrix which multiplies, and this matrix is a matrix of first derivatives. Okay, so let me write it. Here we are, dr1, that function, by dk1, evaluated at star, dr1 by dk2, evaluated at star, dot, 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 dr2 by dk1, Just saying that we can Taylor expand the function. This is a way of writing a Taylor expansion for many variables. But uh, we don't want to keep writing this matrix, so we'll just invent an abbreviation for it. We'll call it L. L for linear, not L for left. Soon we'll be encountering L's, which are left, but this, this is not them. L is linear. Linear operator operating on delta K1 delta k2, so the operation of the renormalization group R, complicated nonlinear problem in general, at least becomes simple in the vicinity of a fixed point, and it becomes like the operation of a linear operator. Suppose L can be diagonalized. I know some of you will ask, what is the guarantee? No guarantee. We try it and we find that it is. Okay. Then it can be written in terms of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which are labeled by M. But there's no reason for the, this L is not a Hermitian or symmetric matrix. Okay. It's a matrix. It's a linear transformation. Therefore, when you diagonalize it, eigenvalue capital lambda, it will have distinct right and left eigenvectors. How have I denoted them? Mm, okay. This is a good notation, but I'm using the bracket notation, but distinguishing between left and right eigenvectors. For those of you who have forgotten about left and right eigenvectors, we'll remind you at some other point. No, no. Because we are making a quiet rush. Okay, so this is equal to, okay, then, so that's that. Okay, we want to apply this on that. We know how this uh, operates on its eigenvectors. So the sensible thing to do is to expand this column vector in terms of the eigenvectors of L, the right eigenvectors. Okay? This is like quantum mechanics. Okay, so let me just do that. So let me write that this is the same as that column as sum over m, sum coefficients hm, q1 
M R. Or expand delta k in terms of eigenfunctions of this. So then L on delta k is very easy. Well, I have to apply L on this, so that's easy, HM times capital lambda sub M on QMR. In fact, it's very easy to apply this L times, L, L raised to L, because each time I'll apply, I'll just put, get a new factor of capital lambda. Okay, I forgot to carry on my subscript B, which is important. B, B, okay, just to remind ourselves that the transformation involved a length rescaling by factor B. Okay, very good. Now we come to another nice argument. We have applied this L times. Each time we've shrunk by a factor B, right? That's why we had this B to the L somewhere. Oh, well, we had it there. But suppose I came in and applied a single renormalization transformation, which shrunk in one shot by a factor B to the L. Take a concrete example. Suppose L is three. Well, let's say four. Our B is 3. 3 raised to 4, quick. 81, right. So now so somebody else comes in and says he doesn't do this RG that we did. We'll do an 81 by 81 block and carry on from there. You know, physically it should be the same. I mean, we're heading to this. So, therefore, it must be that lambda B M raised to the power L is equal to lambda of B raised to L M. Very important. Ponder a little. Okay, now, now we have to move. From this it follows That implies, this implies immediately that lambda sub m must have the form b raised to some power, which we will call small lambda. Exercise for all of you, each of you, or you can do it in groups. Prove this. Hint, take logs and realize that log lambda is a linear function of log b, I think. Something like that. So you do it. Therefore, L raised to L. on uh, delta k1, delta k2. Okay, I'll stop in just a minute. I know I must, did I exit long back? Okay, so it's flashing away. Fortunately, it doesn't go to negative. But, uh, okay, sorry. So this, uh, we'll, we'll stop in exactly one minute, uh, is equal to sum over m, hm, b raised to lambda, L M M Lambda M L, sorry. And uh, times Q M R. Okay, this is all very formal. The q 
coefficients of the right eigenvectors are the scaling fields. They're very important, Hn. Okay? Hn's are the scaling fields. And so now, rather than writing it like this, we note that Hn, under renormalization, or if you like, L to the L, operate, I mean, the effect of L to the L on Hn is to just give you a factor, B raised to lambda, L times lambda M. So we'll just stop with this. I know it's a bit of a mouthful. We need to digest this. Uh, we should digest. Okay. So what we've said is that in the vicinity of this, this fixed point are these directions in coupling constant space. This way, that way. These are the right eigenvectors. Each one involves a different linear combination of the coupling constants. They constitute the scaling fields, not the original things that you put in. This is why in that PT diagram yesterday that I drew, I told you that the proper scaling axis is the continuation of the first order transition. It's not P or T, some linear combination. This is where these come. Scaling fields evolve like this. Do they grow or do they fall? Depends on the value of little lambda. If little lambda is negative, they fall. If little lambda is positive, they grow. Okay, I think we'll stop here because I've far exceeded the time. Yeah. So we didn't quite complete two, and we did, did not begin three. But uh, it's all right. Again, today we did more than half. Okay, I'm sorry, this was again, in the end, a little strong and fast, but uh, I think the algebra is straightforward. The meaning you have to live with. You should go back and 